Hello, my name is Nathaniel Osgood. I'm going to be presenting today a whirlwind glimpse of uh, simulation modeling as applied to health and the three major traditions that constitute it. The motivation uh, for this presentation, indeed for um, um, much of the uh, much of uh, simulation modeling work in general, lies in the fact that we're confronting ever more challenging health policy um, problems. Um, now, these problems are um, uh, not merely uh, complicated, but they're also uh, complex in a, in a technical sense. Um, problems of this sort include uh, syndemics of mutually interacting conditions, consider uh, diabetes and TB or substance abuse, violence, HIV, AIDS. Consider the, the the tangling of more generally of, of, of substance abuse and mental health uh, disorders. We're faced with uh, mental health um, gaps that um, that cry out for um, addressing, um, but also health disparities that really uh, tug at the conscience. Um, in in recent decades, but really dating back to light to the work of uh, Barker. Um, we've been aware of the fact that um, uh, early adverse childhood experiences, uh, uh, say trauma or, or deprivation in early life, cast lifelong uh, shadows, um, uh, precipitating, um, for example, much higher risks of, of chronic disease late in the life course. Whether it's these issues or the issues of, of our aging population and the need to make uh, um, uh, complex health policy challenges in the context of uh, uh, entangling of, of uh, social um, uh, service delivery and health issues. Um, we're increasingly faced with, with challenges which are defined by not more, merely having moving parts, that is not merely being complicated, but being complex in a technical sense. And when, I'm dis when I'm mentioning complexity in a technical sense, I'm talking about <clears throat> situations where we're dealing with tangled coupled problems where uh, the behavior of, of a system as a whole uh, can be very, very different from what you'd expect from looking at its parts individually, where we can't merely to seek understanding about uh, how that system is likely to behave in response to intervention. Um, in, in order to, to understand why we see per certain patterns, we can't simply take it apart in a reductionist way, analyze each piece and expect the understanding to come. Rather, we need to recognize that we're dealing here with holes that are greater than the sum of the parts. We're dealing with, with uh, systems whose behavior as a whole, or in, in large parts of it, are often radically different from um, what we see as the sum or, or, or mean of, of the different subparts. And these sort of systems are, are uh, particularly challenging for us, not merely as an intellectual um, enterprise, but uh, in a way that has enormous practical import because they react surprisingly <clears throat> and indeed pervasively to interventions. Interventions in any one part of the system will often ripple around to cause changes elsewhere. And if we're seeking to put in place, as my colleague Jack McDonald talks about, um, fixes that stay fixed. Uh, we need to understand this, this pervasiveness, the tangled nature of these systems. And if, if we want to achieve high leverage, high cost-effective uh, interventions, we need to understand how these systems are likely to react when we intervene upon them. This is a challenge because the length between where we intervene and the effects are often unclear. They may be delayed or in, and quite distal within the system. Often they're, they're multifaceted and, and reciprocal in a way that, that stymies applications of traditional statistical techniques. Uh, so we'll have uh, feedbacks um, by which a, a given change um, may ripple around and, and amplify or push back that, against that original change. These systems are, are moreover nonlinear um, in the sense that if we undertake it, each of two interventions in isolation and consider their effects, the effects of combining them are very, very different typically than just the sum of the effects of considering each in isolation. 
there's synergies, there's synergies, there's work, ways in which they work across purposes, ways one can lay the groundwork for the other. Um, and in order to, to understand the effect of a policy portfolio considered as a whole, we need to go beyond a reductionist understanding of, of each component of that portfolio and understand it from, as a more complete whole. There's many examples of, of such phenomena. An example uh, where I worked, um, I've had the pleasure of working with our Ministry of Health for many years is emergency department wait times, where you know, the pathology here um, at, at first blush seems to be in terms of uh, the adverse um, impacts of very long waiting times and waiting queues associated with emergency departments. Um, but if one looks into it, the problems that underlie this lie not simply in that unit, the emergency department, but uh, lie across the vast system. Um, these include the fact that wards are crowded. Um, often we can't discharge patients from the, from the emergency department because uh, there's no beds for them in the wards. Uh, why are the wards full? Well, they're full in part because people can't be discharged to the community. Why can't they be discharged? Because certain health services uh, are not available. Um, there may not be uh, beds in the community, but there might also just be a gap between where those beds are and the informal care uh, network of an individual is. There may be um, shortages in terms of uh, availability of allied health professionals, OTs and, and, and PTs, to help assist this person. There may be a lack of effective transportation options. Um, it may be that uh, the person's home is no longer an effective place to go because of inability to keep up with activities of daily living. Many, many reasons. They might not be discharged. So we get into issues having to do with, with service delivery in the community, available of home oxygen, availability of CPAP services, um, support for things like um, eye care. At the same time, there's, uh, there's often factors that drive people into the emergency room unnecessarily from that very community. And if we place someone in a, in a place, say, that's inconvenient for their, uh, for their informal care network or, or inaccessible, they may end up back in the emergency room very quickly. If home care isn't operating quite, uh, properly, if, they're, if they don't have medical homes with primary care physicians, they end up in the emergency room. So when we look at this ostensible prob problem in the emergency room, we have to recognize that its roots lie throughout a broad system. It's a tangled system. And if we try to intervene, we need to understand that because the most efficacious interventions may not lie and often do not lie within the sphere of the immediately obvious problem, but rather elsewhere in the system. The most judicious interventions may lie here, as much of our modeling has concluded, in the community. And yet, traditionally, we're dealing with these systems in a highly siloed fashion. And this tends to lead to, to imbalance in the system, to disproportionate funding, say, going to acute care compared to community. <coughs> excuse me, um, and um, in dysfunction uh, because of that. We may have a system which um, one part um, is, is very well stocked, another part uh, less well stocked. Overall, we're in a good situation, but because of systemic dysfunction, we find ourselves metaphorically going in circles. Often we're dealing with situations where our management of these systems in our mindset of managing the systems, it's equally siloed. You know, another example um, that are dwell less less long on is is the opioid crisis, where um, what ostensibly is a medical problem, um, people overdosing, um, and and uh, tragically in many cases dying uh, from opioid overdoses. What ostensibly, from the police perspective, is a policing problem with dealers and pushing product what from the health from the social services perspective is a social services problem with families rent apart by addictions children having to be uh, placed in foster care etc is in fact a systemic phenomenon it's a phenomenon 
that's yes a social problem yes it's a it's a justice and policing problem yes it's a health problem health being a point of entry health being a point of of um, often addiction to to chronic uh, to, to opioids prescribed for chronic pain or other conditions but where some of those addictions lie in early life experiences and, and traumatic exposures and losses early in life in mistreatment due to addiction in the early generation um and where response to that um, to that uh, opioid use indeed even the how much one uses uh, and how long over time uh, the degree to which it sought through Ill illicit means etc um, are tangled up with our social context so we see in the opioids uh, as in uh, ed weights a system which is um, which has been subject to very siloed management in terms of social services and justice and policing and and health um, uh, often uh, talking only at limited amounts to each other, but the opioid crisis is really resulting from it. And if we want to invest resources for action, we need again to understand the tangled nature of it. But again, it's not merely a matter of the system being um, having many particular components, but it's the fact that these are, are tangled together in ways where the whole is greater than the sum of the parts where an intervention aimed at one, one piece of the system, uh, per, perhaps said um, by the creation of an integrated chronic pain management strategy, um, will, will ripple through the system and affect, say, policing and, and the number of overdoses police are called to address, or the fire department, fire personnel. It may be that an intervention in, in some small areas of the system will have disproportionate effect to another equal investment uh, elsewhere in the system. It may be that two interventions, each individually, would offer limited value, but when you combine them together, you have a winning formula. So when we're dealing with these situations, we're not only dealing with, with, compl with complicated systems, we're not dealing merely with systems that, that exhibit surprising and intellectually curious behavior. We're dealing with real quandaries for practical action. In short, when we're dealing with complex system challenges with purely traditional reductionist methods, methods that allows, allow us to tease apart for example, associations between factors that put aside an, an understanding of, of the causal structure and uh, look allow us to look at the um, piecewise associations, how um, the variation in a given um, a given observable um, co varies with uh, variation in, in, in different factors uh, systemically. When we're trying to take understand the system by taking it apart into each of its pieces and understanding them to parcel things out uh, neatly we find ourselves uh, in a uh, in a real point of, of hardship um, we have difficulty understanding the counterintuitive behavior we see because we can't attribute it to any one piece of the system we have misperceptions of how the system is behaving we interpret uh, rapidly rising um, uh, reports uh, of some condition as a sign of an underlying crisis when really it's a sign that we're we're catching more cases we encounter policy resistance where we undertake a policy only to to have the effects of it uh, diluted or or have it defeated or in fact even to to lose ground on account of of um, uh, adverse um, adverse feedbacks triggered by the uh, by the investment we see cases where uh, a modest investment in one piece of the system may yield huge amounts of of gain across the system but where in other cases a similar side invest size investment will go almost unnoticed in its impact and these phenomena pose real problems problems for learning from our experience Everything seems uh, uh, once off. Everything seems um, completely new. We're, we're drowning in this welter of detail. We have difficulties coordinating people working in, in different areas of the system, in different 
silos of the system often have a have little appreciation for how their actions are, are tied in with um, the and, and dependent upon uh, and need to work in synergy with the actions of others in the system. There's often suspicion, limited understanding um, uh, on those, say, in the in the uh, primary prevention area versus the uh, treatment area or secondary prevention you mix in there. People at different points in the system often uh, behaving at loggerheads because they see themselves fighting for a limited pot of money, where really their collaboration, their cooperation, could achieve a degree of change that would benefit from all of them. Really, they're cutting off their nose to spite their face by adversely interacting with these others and trying to trying to reduce the amount of money the others get in a zero-sum way, where really what's needed is a broader understanding and action catalyzed by it. It's unclear which, which actions to undertake. We have difficulty deciding and to prioritize um, uh, policies and policy portfolios. And we have difficulty trying to understand how to best design the system, to design reporting mechanisms, information, feedbacks, etc. So to address these quandaries, for several decades now, there's been a real shift in science um, in certain quarters towards uh, what's sometimes known as complexity science or system science. And there's many ways we can describe this and, and characterize it, but uh, fundamentally, this uh, I view this as kind of the science of the whole. It deals with these systems where the whole is greater than some of the parts and recognizes uh, the integrity of that understanding. Um, the fact that w when we seek to understand systems, we need to complement the critically important and valuable reductionist understanding processes on the one hand with synthetic or integrative processes that put together those pieces into a bigger whole that recognizes when we when we um, go to understand our systems just like when we build houses we can't have it be totally a matter of, of specialized um, work and, and specialist work we need that general contractor to, to put the whole thing together now, a central way, not the only way, but a central way in which system science aids us is through uh, dynamic models. These models go by many names, uh, simulation models, dynamic models, mathematical models, models of the physics of the system, etc., and models uh, names for various subtypes, that many of which we'll talk about later. But fundamentally, these models share certain characteristics. They help us share and reason consistently about the implications of our hypotheses concerning how things work. Um, and um, for many modelers, they take a, a generativist perspective. We don't truly understand a phenomenon until we can, we can generate it, until it emerges out of something that doesn't presuppose it. Now, more significantly yet, it's fruitful to view these models as dynamic hypotheses, as kind of theories, as it were, concerning what's going on out there in the world, concerning the underlying processes that, that give rise to patterns that we do see, the causal structure that underlies observed patterns. To, to use um, a terms familiar to listeners um, uh, who may have uh, encountered uh, critical realism, we're, we're trying to understand here the generative mechanisms that Pawson and Tilly speak about in, in effective evaluation. We need to understand here um, the causal structure, um, in large part because we want to understand how to undertake effective action and to understand why, at the level of, of the mechanics, we see certain patterns. When we seek to understand the effects of our actions, we're typically talking about counterfactuals, typically talking about situations where we undertake an action, say a policy portfolio we put into place in our jurisdiction at this time, which is where the effects of that have, have not been observed before. And we want to know if we changed this certain thing, how would it change the, the 
the health outcomes we see in the population. How would it change population health? How would it change waiting times in the uh, ED, etc.? Now, beneath the scenes, simulation models are, uh, despite what you may hear occasionally to the contrary, computational realizations of some mathematical process. Um, there's sometimes shallow discussion of equation-based modeling versus uh, uh, algorithmic modeling, and uh, those are rather superficial uh, distinctions from a deeper perspective. Um, uh, but what is the case is there's many different frameworks for characterizing, for specifying simulation models that that have uh, differences in the formalisms they use, the, the particulars of how they specify the processes, how they, how they phrase these dynamic hypotheses, these ideas for what's going on out there in the population. But all of them fundamentally characterize some posited or, or, or um, uh, to be a hypothesized process, often to let us understand the the logical implications of making those assumptions and for example to be able to test whether it's consistent with empirical evidence. So so these models can be viewed as dynamic hypotheses representing these causal structures and they, they represent critically, remember it's more than the sum of the parts, the relationship between different factors. And these models provide us a way to examine the system-wide consequences consequences that are not localized of a change in, in one area of the system. So if we do put into place improved prescribing processes that, that, that have a tighter control over the, um, the level of, of, uh, of uh, opioids prescribed for chronic pain or the, the conditions under which they will be prescribed, um, if we change the dosing um, or the, uh, the uh, count um, of doses prescribed for palliative care, how do those ripple through the system? Um, uh, if we provide naloxone kits to a wide variety of individuals, how do those uh, ripple through? If we were to put in place um, expanded options for uh, transitional care, within a, um, a broader system, or if we were to put into place mechanisms for improved um, uh, transportation accessible by elderly, uh, how would that help reduce emergency wait times? And these models, by allowing us to, to phrase these things and to investigate counterfactuals, they allow us to, 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 to understand and investigate in much the way an engineer or scientist does system vulnerabilities and leverage points, um, areas where a given investment will have uh, little to no impact versus areas where it has uh, a major impact on, on cost effectiveness or, or cost or, or in terms of um, uh, health outcomes, etc. They clue us into ways of changing system structure and improve ways of working together. Now, I've noted that models represent these causal relationships, um, but by so doing, we characterize, we not only have the benefit of, of taking that understanding, that positive set of causal relationships out of our head and putting it in the clear light of day where it can be critiqued, refined, etc., by others, we also benefit from the fact that we're characterizing it in an operationalizable way. And that's a fancy term. What I'm talking about is using that characterization that we put into place for simulation models, this characterization of the causal relationships, specifying this dynamic hypothesis in a precise way as it, it phrases the hypothesized causal structure or the for this exercise to be characterized causal structure we can use a, a computer to understand the implied behavior. So given that characterization, what is the induced behavior of the system over time? If we posit that this is the underlying um, set of relationships in the system, what does that mean in terms of the outcomes that we observe? What does it mean in terms of um, how the system state will evolve over time. Um, 
and 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 how uh, the ways in which we uh, should expect to see change if we undertake action on the system. Now, when we do this, when we when we precisely specify um, our assumptions about the model in terms of these causal relationships, the dynamic hypotheses, we're specifying often a, our assumptions about the system in a way that says how, given the current situation in the system, how does the model change? The different formalisms di differ in how we specify this. For system dynamics, we're specifying rates of change that are implied, the values of the flows. For agent-based modeling, we're specifying, the, say, that the hazard rates of transitioning from one state to the other, or the timing of that transition, um, or we'll specify sending a message under certain conditions. And what happens is, once we specify that and we ask the software to run these models, we see behavior that emerges from them that's often surprising. It's emergent. It, it's not something that can be reduced to any one piece of the model. It results from the interaction of a broad set of factors tangled in the model in a way that broadly reflects their tangling in the world. If it's a, if it's a uh, model characterizing uh, carefully these phenomena in the world. And because these systems exhibit nonlinear characteristics um, in the world, the models do as well. Now, we're dealing here with the sphere of, of, of human activity and human understanding. And uh, models are tools that help us learn more quickly and advance that understanding. But they are, like with all the other types of, of um, hypotheses that we might characterize in, in prose and in logic models or what have you, they're subject to shortcomings, misunderstandings. Um, Inasmuch as they're depicting things in the world, we can analogize models to maps. Um, uh, maps that, that um, are solid or, or maps that are sometimes off in certain representations. This analogy is more than a superficial one. Um, models represent abstractions like maps that features the world. They hide a lot of detail. And they omit detail not as a shortcoming, but to make them feasible, make them useful to build. The only perfect map of, of the world is the world itself. And that's not a very useful map when we're trying to navigate certain aspects of the world. Um, and so it is with models. We, we omit details so we can think with greater clarity about the system. We can pursue a description of the system more quickly. And we can understand the logical implications of the system by running that model much more, uh, much more quickly as well. So we omit details in a way that strengthens the model. It's not a limitation. It's, it's, it's a strength that we have this ability to omit detail. More deep, or equally importantly, like maps, models omit detail based on their purpose. They're, they're specific to purpose. John Sturman talks about model purpose being used as a logical knife to excise away unnecessary complexity. Which details we omit depends on how we want to use the model. All models like maps are 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 wrong, but it's the very incompleteness, the fact that they do omit details that allows them to, to confer value. With an incredibly detailed map of the world, we're, we're never going to be able to fit in our GPS system or fit it in the in our in our car. But which map we use will depend on purpose. If we're seeking to bike across LA or seeking to take the subway across LA if we're seeking to drive across LA or indeed to, to walk or jog across LA, we'll typically use rather different maps. If we're seeking to fix brownouts in LA or solve flooding problems in LA yeah, following the storms, we, we need to use different maps. So models like maps are specific to the purpose. Now with models, it's more difficult to ascertain a priori what information should be omitted. And often there's this learning process. We put information in, we learn from it, and that makes us more savvy about, about what we need, if anything, to add to secure our purposes. There's a lot of common concerns that all the modeling traditions I'll be talking about and introducing here share. One of the most fundamental 
is that of model scope. They're all abstractions, and we have to decide what things are in the model and what things are out. But it turns out that we can be more fine-grained in our description of this um, than just saying, is it in or out? We distinguish in particular between three types of ways that something might relate to the model. There are some quantities that are generated by the model that, as we say, are endogenous to the model. The model produces these for us. They're emergent uh, from the model. Uh, the model is calculating them. We can use different terms for it, but we don't presuppose them putting them into the model, but rather the model is, is giving rise to them. It has a theory, say, of, of opioid overdose, and we specify a bunch of other assumptions, and it tells us under these policy regimes, under these these uh, environmental conditions concerning, say, um, employment opportunities, etc., under these prescribing um, uh, guidelines, etc., this um, these are the levels of opioid deaths we would expect to see. So. Um, in these cases, uh, the generation of this data allows us to understand how uh, the world might react in response to, say, policy changes or, or other counterfactuals like adverse environment or adverse environmental or economic or weather conditions, etc. There's another set of quantities. Um, so those were endogenous quantities. There's another set called exogenous, which are represented in the model in pre-specified way. Here, we simply say, yeah, we're, we want to represent this. We want to capture um, the assumptions here, um, as, say, involving economic conditions. And we introduce them into the model as an assumption. And the model can consider them as a result. There's many quantities that we will consciously and sometimes unconsciously, but hopefully much of it is conscious, omit from the model. We'll, we'll ignore them. This is not a shortcoming of the model. Often this, this helps build our learning much more quickly, but it is a trade-off. We have to prioritize what things do we add into the model, and it's advised to pursue that in an incremental way, add things in one bit at a time, even if we're confident that eventually these things will be incorporated in an exogenous or even endogenous way. Often we start by putting them aside, ignoring them for the sake of, of building understanding. And it's with that understanding that we'll make much more savvy choices about what to put in next. Capturing more factors endogenously adds flexibility, investigative power, and, and, and accuracy often, but often requires, it, it slows down learning, requires more time and resources to build. And um, often, and, and certainly putting it in from the very first is inadvised because it may shortchange our ability to be much more savvy in what we put in the basis of learning that goes on based on the models. You know, there's a, a, a broad misunderstanding one will find out there um, from both uh, lay people and, and some scientists um, that dynamic models um, represent um, a sort of crystal ball, an attempt to, to predict the world. And sometimes the terms that are used in terms of predictive analytics um, do not by themselves head off this understanding, this misunderstanding. But I would argue that it's it's not very helpful to view models as, as crystal balls. Some people do. I think it's very dangerous. In fact, extremely dangerous. Um, uh, rather, I think models are much more much better viewed as, in the words of uh, Jeff McDonald, as learning prostheses. We think of prosthesis as as um, something that helps complement um, our limitations. Despite our limitations, it makes it fully functional, us fully functional. And so it is with, with uh, simulation models. But unlike, a, uh, say, an, an artificial leg um, or a prosthetic arm, models are designed uh, of this order, designed not to address physical limitations, but rather thinking limitations. 
The fact is, many studies have shown that even the most technical among us are exceptionally poor in understanding the consequences of rich dynamic hypotheses, of hypotheses concerning the world, concerning how different factors relate to each other. We're very poor at understanding their, their um, yeah, implications, thinking through these implications consistently. So we use models in this way, much as a, a prosthetic limb allows us to achieve functionality. We use models to help complement our thinking. It's not that the models are, are necessarily right, but, but by doing this, by thinking through more consistently, quickly, and reliably their implications, we can more quickly spot inconsistencies between what the model would suggest, what our hypotheses suggest, and what the evidence is. We can spot, in short, more quickly latent oversights in our thinking, latent misunderstandings in our thinking, and remedy them more, think more quickly. We're not using it, models here as a crystal ball, but as, as a tool to allow us to think more effectively, to spot more quickly our oversights, our misunderstandings, our mis misplaced assumptions, our overconfidence. And, and thereby, they allow us to put whatever empirical evidence we have to better use by, by allowing it to craft, to, to, to refine in the crucible of, of uh, clear, consistent reasoning um, our, our thinking about the world, and thereby refine that thinking. It allows us to advance our understanding and in our choice of which data to collect and, and to inform our choices. So modeling here is, 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 is not something which is a static quantity. It's not a model delivered, but modeling that sharpens our model, our, our mental model, through interactions with the model. By observing its behavior, we sharpen our, our mental model. And, and then we'll make we'll seek additional evidence from the world to fill in key uncertainties in the model, key in terms of their, their impact on policy choice or model outcomes. We'll make extra types of observations from the world, or we'll undertake actions in the world, interventions, say, based on understanding from the model. We'll compare what we see in the world against what the model expected, and thereby refine the model and, by extension, our thinking. The model here is not a crystal ball. It's a way of, of allowing us to iterate more quickly about uncertainty in, in the presence of uncertainty. And when the uncertainty is largest, it's not a reason to not model. When, when the data is, is perplexing or absent, we often model to advance our understanding of which data is most important to, correct, to collect. We advance our understanding uh, concerning how things using the very limited data we have might might be out there working in the world and critically to learn more quickly as new evidence comes in so we can take greatest benefit of the limited evidence so you know when we're relying on on traditional reasoning uh, alone we may have some theory as to what's going on in the world but we can't test whether it's consistent with empirical evidence we can't put it in that crucible um, of, of clear reasoning. It has some implied behavior that's too hard for us to, to reason about in our head, and it's not amenable to traditional techniques. But a dynamic model lets us map that theory to implied dynamics, which we can then test against the empirical observations. Even more significantly yet, when we're reasoning about choices to be made, interventions, policies to be put into effect, say a, pol a portfolio of counterfactual interventions, we need to understand how those are likely to have effect. And if we have some theory of, of, of underlying health-related processes, often trying to figure out how that would interact with different interventions is very, very challenging. It's a real quandary. And, you know, we're trying to achieve some desired outcomes. Maybe it's improved uh, 
improved uh, population health with respect to certain measures. Maybe it's a lower wait times in the emergency room, fewer, um, fewer deaths from opioids or less opioid dependence in the population. Pick your, pick your outcome. If we're dealing purely with informal reasoning, it's hard to know, well, what do we need here to yield these outcomes giving the underlying processes an effect? What a simulation model, again, does is helps us map an understanding of the interventions in the underlying processes to understand their implied dynamics, which then, by iterating with different possible portfolios of interventions, say, different possible policy regimes, we can arrive at some that will best match the health outcomes uh, that we want. While its application to simulation and computer-based simulation is quite new, the fundamental ideas here are, are, are ancient and I would add honorable in their, in their origins. Um, uh, Francis Bacon, in a quote, uh, uh, quote uh, given to me by the sage of Sydney, Jeff McDonnell, commented um, in Latin, of course, that truth will sooner, sooner come out of error than from confusion. We're and, and that can sound like a real quandary. How can it be that we can arrive at truth more quickly by making mistakes compared to confusion? And, and, and this was a, a, a 17th century version of fail early, fail often. Try something. You see whether you're in error and learn from it and refine your understanding. And the idea here, it's better to be transiently wrong by putting a stake in the ground, positing something and investigating the consequences and testing in the clear light of day whether they're consistent with, with what we see empirically um, uh, than it is to, to just rely upon sort of the, the vagaries of, of long, um, uh, long prose uh, statements of things, to rely on, 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 say, logic models or other models that, that are not testable in terms of, of allowing them to be run and compared against evidence. By allowing us to, to specify a hypothesis with great precision, modeling allows us to, to test it against uh, available data and allows us to iterate more quickly to support theorizing about what's going on out there. It aids in theory building, testing, and refinement. And again, I want to emphasize in the absence of really good data, this is not merely a luxury we can't undertake rather it's a it's a it's an even more key process to be able to learn quickly because uh, often we don't have the the luxury on a fast moving opioid epidemic that's just starting to learn slowly um we need something to make sense of what evidence we do have advance theories and test them without being terrified that our model will be wrong but rather recognizing that it is this tool that will help us advance. It's not the model, it's the modeling to, um, to sort of adapt uh, Dwight Eisenhower's co uh, comment about uh, planning and plans. And even putting forward a poor, mo uh, the poor model often help, help us advance knowledge by allowing us to spot these inconsistencies between our assumptions on the one hand and the evidence. But it's more than that, because, uh, ladies and gentlemen, models of this sort, by making explicit our assumptions uh, about the system, by allowing us to put this stake in the ground that characterizes our, our understanding of the system, we can then expose that thinking to the, to the clear light of day. We can invite critique from a community we can open up the floor for discussion, for contrasting my understanding with your understanding. We can allow my understanding to be critiqued, yes, in light of empirical evidence, but also in light of, of hard observation by many, by work in the trenches that many have undertaken, by which they might point out an omission, point out a, 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 a too, um, too egregious a simplification. In short, by taking this understanding out of our heads and putting it into an explicit form, 
we advance our understanding not merely because it's operationalizable, we can run it and test its consistency, we also put ourselves in a position of learning from others, of learning from the community. And this too aids learning that's faster and deeper from evidence. This process aids us as well in, in managing of, of complex systems. Once these models have survived the crucible of comparison with, with empirical data, with understanding from other system stakeholders, they can serve as, as what-if tools. Once we've, oh, we're, we're moving beyond uh, theory testing and theory building, we can engage in what Ross Hammond calls theory explication, where we're, we're using this tool um, on the basis of the theory that's captured it, that seems to hold water, to identify desirable policies. Policies desirable from the perspective of cost effectiveness, of high lever being high leverage or robust, robust given the uncertainties. We can evaluate the benefits of restructuring our system. We can better understand trends, make, make sense of the interaction of diverse factors. We can prioritize and, and our data collection by identifying data points that have disproportionate impact on our choice between policy regimes or, 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 or particulars of intervention strategies or implementation strategies for an intervention. We can use it to cross-check the consistency of data, which n not infrequently has has varying standards or varying um, uh, pedigree associated with it. Um, we may spot inconsistencies that were due to changes in process or standards that had remained uh, latent, hidden within the process. And we can understand context, uh, sets of contexts which certain strategies can be can be carried over. Here we're representing the mechanism that Pawson and Tilly talk about in their critical realist perspective, but also, ladies and gentlemen, the context, um, and we can we can represent that context explicitly rather than brushing it under the rug as as uh, so many attempts at, at, at traditional evaluation uh, have done. And of course, with this sort of tool, we can engage in, in communication. Now, I'd, I'd like to talk about um, some of the modeling traditions that, that support this sort of modeling. And I think what I'm going to do is to, to give a, a whirlwind glimpse uh, of each of these that will concentrate a little bit more on history than some of my past uh, contributions. System dynamics as a tradition dates back to the 1950s and the work of uh, Jay Forrester um, uh, within the sphere of, of uh, cybernetics um, and then within the Sloan School of Management at MIT. But it has a, a very close cognate, which is compartmental modeling, um, ordinary different equation modeling, which really dates back to the 1670s with the august uh, features of, of Newton and Leibniz, um, the, 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 the co-inventors, um, independent inventors of the calculus, who articulated uh, differential equations in their um, you know, proto-form um, uh, back in the 1700s. Um, uh, and in the health sphere, uh, it's been applied since the 1910s by the work of, of Ross and the 1920s by Kermick and McKendrick, much of it undertaken by a generation of exemplarily trained, well-trained um, um, medical professionals who also um, carried formidable mathematical, um, uh, mathematical uh, level of knowledge. Um, Ross and Kermick and McKendrick applying it to infectious disease, wherefore, since that point, it served as a linchpin, compartmental modeling, for reasoning about the patterns we see in infectious disease in the population, the ebb and flow uh, associated with stocks of susceptibles. And it's really contributed a very strong understanding of the, the dynamics, indeed the mathematical epidemiology of, of infectious diseases. And they were motivated by patterns in part, um, um, such as a writ large over uh, historic records, um, 
um, the waxing and waning of childhood infectious diseases here in chickenpox uh, in Saskatchewan or measles and mumps in Saskatchewan. And what's striking is we can see those patterns uh, writ large uh, from other jurisdictions, uh, England and Wales with respect to measles uh, being a, a, a very well documented example. Um, and there's an underlying mathematics that uh, compartmental modeling helped bring out. Now, system dynamics modeling drew on the mathematical formalisms of compartmental modeling of, of ordinary differential equations, but took it in a very different direction, a direction that's stakeholder accessible, a direction that's amenable to graphical depiction, and in a direction that focused on accumulation and feedback as key processes as motivated by the work of, of, of Jay Forrester earlier in, in cybernetics. Uh, Forrester is a professor at uh, an MIT School of Engineering, um, uh, worked on feedback control systems. In the late 50s and 1960s, based on um, uh, family experience, he, he grew interest in applying these techniques to industrial problems. Um, uh, and uh, began, began what he termed uh, industrial dynamics, contributing a paper uh, by that title uh, in the Harvard uh, Business, um, Business Review, as I recall, in the, in the late 50s, I believe it was 58 or 59. And then um, uh, at the dawning, age, uh, dawning uh, days of the 1960s, industrial dynamics book appeared um, with no less than hand-drawn figures for its uh, first version. Um, our early uh, work in this area was contributed in the, in the Dynamo language, which was a specialized language for, for characterizing um, uh, system dynamics models, although very crude by uh, today's language standards um, and, and woefully short of, of best practices on, from a declarative language standpoint that we know of from today's uh, computer science research, it provided a uh, admirably uh, concise way of specifying uh, system dynamics models. In the 1960s, um, uh, there was uh, building on this work, uh, Forrester's seminal contributions, was growing diversity of industrial models and models that also sought to apply the techniques to broader um, issues of societal concern, including uh, urban dynamics. Um, uh, the um, the uh, adversity that was being sensed within um, uh, within uh, urban blight, um, uh, the uh, the advent of the Great Society and social housing, um, and uh, some of the dynamics associated with uh, with things extending out for that, uh, with uh, employment opportunities, with crime, etc. The nineteen seventies were a um, were at the one time a period uh, of great uh, growth and a period of, of uh, danger for system dynamics. Um, with a particular uh, note being the diversity of, of work that emerged um, applying system dynamics to new areas, notably including um, areas of health, um, and the articulation by Barry Richmond, despite a great deal of adversity, um, faced by other members of the community in, in seeking to leverage a new generation of, of computers, microcomputers, with Richmond's interests particularly lying on, on the, uh, the, the point-and-click interfaces supported by the first generation of Macintoshes, um, this idea of broadly accessible models, models that would be built, specified not not simply in terms of ordinary differential equations, but would provide a, a graphical abstraction of that model that would allow you to focus in on key elements of it. The stocks, that is the accumulations, the, the flows that drive them, the interconnection, which variables were posited to depend on which others, highlight the feedback loops, highlight the accumulations, in a way that would be accessible, and therefore, I might add, critiquable and feedbackable by, um, and, and, and catalyze feedback by members of the public, 
by people with no training in this area. This was a radical vision. It was a vision against which uh, certain segments of the system dynamics community expressed uh, great, uh, uh, great concern, caution, and even hostility. Um, but it was one that um, proved um, foundational in system dynamics evolution. But at the same time, there was um, adversity on other fronts. System dynamics, um, by virtue of contributions associated with um, uh, commissioned um, uh, by the uh, Club of Rome, um, uh, focused uh, models on limits to growth uh, from a planetary scale. Um, at a planetary scale, the um, uh, going beyond traditional conceptions of um, the Earth as uh, as uh, supporting a, an ever increasing and dizzyingly rich array of, of technology. Uh, uh, highlighting certain limits that that uh, were likely to be binding in the long term, and uh, uh, while uh, current um, uh, in the um, here in the uh, second decade of the uh, of the two thousands, um, at that time um, that was seen as uh, as radical. Um, and by many, including economists, who saw system dynamics as, as um, an upstart seeking to presumptuously intrude upon their turf, um, uh, this was uh, even dangerously unprofessional and um, seen as, as uh, amateurish and, uh, and uh, an intrusion um, uh, upon the, the privileges of uh, of uh, economists' ability to, to be the ones consulted about, about such broad matters. As a result of this, uh, system dynamics came under great, um, uh, great uh, critique, uh, scrutiny, but also um, criticism. Much of it, in my view, um, uh, shallow. Um, much of it um, omitting um, a firm understanding of uh, of, of what dynamic modeling brings to bear by people who had only in their lives ever applied very different types of models with very different goals. But this contribution did shape um, the system dynamics community in ways that, um, uh, that are seen uh, even today. Now, system dynamics has since that time broadened greatly as a discipline. Um, uh, the work that Barry Richmond um, uh, his his vision, his um, you know, dream of making system dynamics models with their their accumulations and their processes of change, with their feedbacks accessible to a broad audience, has been largely realized. Even the most quantitative models in system dynamics will often put an emphasis on articulation, a specification, and framework that's accessible to wide variety of stakeholders that can be critiqued by other members of the system dynamics community and modelers, yes, but also by those bringing domain knowledge. A key aspects, ladies and gentlemen, of uh, aspect of learning uh, faster, more deeply, and more reliably uh, from, from dynamic models. At the same time, system dynamics as, as a, um, um, as a uh, methodology um, has broadened to include a wide variety of other um, approaches that particularly value um, model mapping. Um, here I depict what's called a causal loop diagram, which um, uh, posits relationship between a, a bunch of different factors, which are, are, are not quantitative, but they're not purely qualitative either. They capture polarities in associations, and they allow us to reason through some of the linkages in a more consistent way. These causal loop diagrams being accessible to a wide variety of stakeholders, often within minutes upon explanation, and thereby allowing us to elicit from those stakeholders understanding. System dynamics, within the sphere of dynamic modeling, system dynamics is particularly notable on account of a couple of factors. Um, uh, one is its its focus on feedbacks is a fundamental shaper of behavior over time and our ability to manage the system. 
This is not an accident. Feedbacks are, are not merely uh, small curiosities about a system. It's because feedbacks, as Jay Forrester knew from his work in, in cybernetics, um, have profound effect on uh, the evolution of, of systems. With positive feedbacks, we often get instability. We get situations where we can very quickly um, uh, develop to adversity or virtuous cycles where, say, a company can grow by leaps and bounds because of the popularity of its products and word of mouth extending from them. At the same time, um, balancing feedbacks, negative feedbacks, can lead to, to great stability of a system beyond what we'd ever anticipate um, uh, if we were to to look beyond those feedbacks or, or to not um, consider them. These things jointly, the very rapid change of a system, um, perhaps in response to an intervention in a, in a positive direction, perhaps in response to a uh, to, an, uh, to a, a, a poorly, a judici injudiciously chosen intervention in, in an adverse direction can really affect our ability to manage the system. When we have these negative feedbacks, we need to understand them because otherwise we may be engaged in a Sisyphusian task, undertaking action where the system pushes back against ourselves and eventually defeats our, our, our intervention. And accumulations um, being critical as causes for inertia, uh, for delay, and for disequilibria also came uh, as, a, as a fundamental um, a focus of system dynamics, representing their importance within um, the dynamic modeling sphere. System dynamics as a community has tended to embrace um, understanding of, of our cognitive limitations um, as a motivation for modeling, but also tends as a general rule to make use of simpler models. Um, this is both partly forced by the formalisms that are used, uh, having a harder time representing heterogeneity, for example, but also also motivated by the, the central desire to, to help learning to improve mental models. System dynamics has come to really prize uh, stakeholder participation in the modeling process, using these sort of formalisms to, to elicit understanding from stakeholders. Um, but at the same time, um, important elements of the community, um, including the, um, the speaker, um, have long made, made um, a use, a strong use of system dynamics, a formal basis in differential equations to enhance reasoning and analysis of models, to, to reason about a model's behavior over a wide variety of parameters, to identify long-term behavior, etc. I will note that system dynamics in health has tended um, uh, um, uh, with, with few exceptions associated with our own work to focus on very high-level models. I, I view this as a, um, uh, as a regretful misapplication of a lot of uh, a lot of effort. I think things could be um, uh, greatly enhanced in terms of the uh, contributions through uh, ad additional uh, contributions using system dynamics, uh, say within agents, um, uh, system dynamics to characterize dynamics of continuous variables uh, within people or organizations. Um, but um, the fundamental observation here, system dynamics can be applied at, at many different levels of granularity. System Dynamics has, for years and years, um, really since it's uh, close to its inception, say um, back to the 60s at least, really focused on broadening mental models of a situation, um, helping us to, again, learn more quickly to arrive at improvements as a means of thinking about the system, um, and recognizing that much in the way of policy failure can be ascribable to mental models that are too narrow or too simplistic from a dynamic perspective. And system dynamics has, um, as a methodology, um, sought to, to foster broader understanding of, of underlying system. Um, and indeed, if you look at the, the history in the health sphere, we can find many, many cases of where 
um, uh, policies that have been undertaken without an understanding of uh, the dynamics of the underlying system have led to blowback. Now within system dynamics quantitative modeling, we're dealing with uh, stocks and flows, stocks being accumulation, flows driving the rates of change of those accumulations. So we might have a stock associated with count of people who are with diabetes uh, without complications, another stock of diabetes with complications. There'll be a flow between them representing development of complications. Another flow into the stock of diabetes with uh, diabetes without complications might represent diagnosis, uh, might represent development of, of um, of diabetes, um, say from a pre-diabetes state. And here the stocks, the value of the stocks, the state of the system is captured by the stocks and they determine the value of the flows at a given time. Say um, the number of people with diabetes um, will, uh, without complications, will naturally influence how many people uh, develop complications. If there's nobody with diabetes without complications, there's no diabetics who are going to be developing a complication the next little bit. At the same time, the values of the flows dictate the change, the rate of change of stocks over time. So if we have a flow in of people um, developing diabetes, that will lead to a change in the number of people with diabetes. It turns out these stock and flow diagrams have underlying well-defined mathematics based on ordinary differential equations, in other words, a type of state equation. And analysis of these models mathematically, while I won't go into it, can provide great insight. But very importantly, um, in our own work, can tie in with tools such as uh, particle filtering, particle MC, MC, and modern tools of data science to leverage um, rich sets of data as increasingly available. I'd like to go on to discussion of agent-based modeling. Agent-based modeling uh, is a tradition that, um, like system dynamics, uh, date, dates back um, uh, many decades. Um, uh, and uh, it, it dates back even a little bit earlier, certainly than, than Forrester's work, although certainly um, not as far as the, the foundational work of Newton and Leibniz. Um, much of the history, in my view, uh, can be traced back to ideas from um, uh, a pioneer, uh, pioneering polymath, um, a John von Neumann, who um, contributed in, in uh, seminal ways in the computer science area, um, but also in many other areas, such as um, including uh, physics and mathematics. Um, uh, he worked jointly with uh, Polish mathematician Stanislaw Ulam um, uh, in the 40s, um, where they uh, worked to invent a, a cellular automaton, a, um, a depiction, a model of computation where you have um, uh, discrete um, uh, interacting units um, in a way that typically became a discrete time. Each cell, say, is uh, live or dead in the game of life, and and uh, whether a cell that is live continues to be live in the next step depends on the number of cells around it that are live, or the chance that a, a given empty cell will be colonized depends on the number of cells around it. But agent-based modeling, following these contributions to the cellular automaton area, which remain of interest, um, not least because of heat dissipation issues, etc., with modern uh, cent more centralized uh, computers. Um, uh, for many decades, it was under um, underdeveloped. Uh, in the 1970s, um, uh, a number of, of seminal uh, models were contributed. Schelling segregation model, which started a model played on a um, on a um, checkerboard, um, um, provided a, an intriguing stylized uh, depiction of ways in which um, patterns eerily um, uh, reminiscent of segregation could emerge from very limited number of preferences for individuals within society. It was very similar to a cellular automaton with the uh, proviso here that individuals could move uh, from one space to another. Conway's Game of Life um, popularized it, uh, particularly in, in um, 
uh, the work of, of Dudney and Scientific American, um, and mathematical recreations uh, brought uh, uh, the cellular automata captured in the game of life to popular attention, um, and actually led to it being um, uh, spending massive amount of simulation time on uh, diverse computers worldwide. Um, uh, it was it was commented at one point that Conway's Game of Life, um, probably more than any given program in computing history to that point, had a disproportionate uh, share of computing time worldwide for for a period of years. Um, Axelrod uh, uh, at at Michigan uh, contributed uh, uh, work in the Iterator Prisoner's Dilemma, taking uh, the so-called Prisoner's Dilemma problem. Um, in, in iterating it and using uh, agents to sort of explore different strategies for prisoner's dilemma, always defect, always cooperate, tit for tat, etc. The work at Los, um, work from these areas caught attention at Los Alamos National Labs where agent-based modeling was undertaken. Um, in the 1980s really saw the emergence of the Santa Fe Institute and um, um, computational management, organizational theory, um, uh, as a um, as a field uh, uh, interdisciplinary group, I shouldn't say field, but interdisciplinary grouping that uh, brought together those from uh, many disciplines, including mathematics or computer science or or uh, operations research and, and management science. Um, to computationally understand systems, and agent-based modeling was a key tool in the toolbox. Uh, when I started using it in, in 1990, um, uh, I had the privilege of, of using um, uh, and experiencing one of the very first, uh, um, perhaps beta version of Star Logo. Later became NetLogo Swarm. We saw the emergence of of uh, platforms for performing uh, agent-based modeling. Um, uh, through the uh, through the 90s, um, and uh, even specialized hardware for um, for cellular automata, such as I worked on, and uh, uh, a wide variety of of, of tools. Um, in the 2000s, there was uh, an explosion in diversity of work, including in health, um, including uh, some of my own work, uh, but also work by um, uh, by Hammond, uh, uh, Josh Epstein, um, uh, Axtell, and 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 others, um, such as in the smoking area. Um, and uh, since that point, the diversity of work has has only grown. What are these? What is this agent-based modeling? Well, agent-based models depict um, one or more populations of individual agents, and this is the distinction from system dynamics. System dynamics, we have stock that counts the number of of of, of uh, agents, uh, number of individuals of a given sort, and we don't in system dynamics individuate. Here, we individuate uh, between people or between other agents, maybe service dogs. Uh, could be, um, in, in some cases, uh, organizations, uh, community organizations, or what have you. Each of these uh, agents is associated with a set of characteristics. One of them is, is parameters. And here, for a given agent, for example, we might represent this agent as being associated with an ethnicity, a sex, and an income. And in the simulation, um, we take the description of what, what is an individual and we associate particular people with characteristics drawn from the schema, drawn from these, these attributes. We also associate agents with uh, some um, typically evolving state. And notably in, in system dynamics, while well, state is always uh, continuous here, um, a star holds a continuous quantity, um, within agent-based modeling, we have a state uh, for an individual that can either be continuous or discrete. Um, in system dynamics, if, if we need to keep track of something that's continuous like age, we, we discretize it. We have a stock for people of, say, uh, 0 to 4 years old, another stock of uh, 5 to 9 years old, another 10 to 14. We have to segregate them into different stocks, each keeping track of the number of people like that. 
with with agent-based modeling, we we can associate someone with a continuous age uh, or a continuous income. Um, it's just a, a number associated with that agent. Um, more critically, though, we can have rules that we need rules um, um, associated with evolving state. And and I like Ross Hammond like to distinguish between rules that specify the the conditions under which actions that evolve the state take place. So um, one popular way within the AnyLogic package and, and since adopted by Repast some as well, um, in a slightly less fulsome way, concerns state charts. Um, a state chart depicts states an agent could be in. Here there's two concerns demonstrated. So we have states involving, say, infection, someone could be ex uh, susceptible, exposed, infected, recovered. But we also have um, actions that can change from one state to the other in rules um, depicted by these little icons here that, that govern under what conditions those uh, actions will apply, under what conditions they're triggered. Here, as you can see, we might have several concerns associated with an individual. A given individual might have many concerns, perhaps uh, 10 of them, um, different types of concerns. Um, uh, it might you know, span uh, attitudes towards care-seeking, infection status, um, uh, might, might concern their, whether they're diagnosed or not, uh, whether they're under treatment uh, or not, um, uh, might concern aspects of their uh, employment situation. So um, typically we have state and we have uh, actions that change state and rules under which they apply. Um, and then we have ways in which they might um, uh, interact. Um, uh, for example, uh, agents might interact through, um, through networks. Um, agents uh, might uh, be placed in space and uh, interact with that space. Uh, depositing pathogen uh, here, prions in, in space is deposited by, by deer in a model we built with Cheryl Waldner. Here within Saskatoon, with agents circulating uh, uh, around the, the city, making use of geographically specific resources. Or here in some of our work in, in LA with WIC and, and Mei Wong's team at, at UCLA. Um, within this context, we're capturing aspects of, uh, uh, of the environment. And often we'll get emergent behavior that consists not merely of patterns over time like we see in system dynamics but patterns over space patterns that may be unexpected in terms of concentration um, patterns associated with use of of resources in contrast to system dynamics which is traditionally although far without exception um, there's many exceptions um, to this um, where models are deterministic agent based models are typically Stochastic. There are, again, ex exceptions. Conway's game of life is completely deterministic. But for the most part, harking back to the shelling segregation model, agent-based models are, are stochastic, most typically. And it's partly because, in contrast to system dynamics, which tends to deal with broad patterns at a higher level than particular events, agent-based models, um, like, as we'll see, discrete event models, concentrate on things at the um, at, a, at a lower level and uh, events are recognized uh, events that might be associated with say transition from from one state uh, to uh, another here um, an infection event from one individual uh, to another and and indeed uh, within um, most agent-based models uh, we run the model by by simulating successive events and partly because of that, and partly because the, the vagaries of the timing of events is so stochastic, um, we have stochastics built into the model. Um, and to ensure model results, the, the results, the regularities we see are not merely flukes, we need to run the model many times over. Um, uh, and we'll see that there's often some variability between the different outcomes but there are certain broad regularities that are captured by all such runs. Um, 
I will note that this adds substantially to the cost associated with these models, um, the performance cost. Um, uh, we have to run the model many, many times, but it is easily parallelizable, and much of our work is, is focused indeed on, on parallelizing agent-based models these days. Um, stochastics uh, here are a uh, significant asset. We can view variability as a um, strength in the sense that it allows us, for example, to to understand um, and compare against uh, variability we see in the population, such as in you know, age-specific incidence rates. Do we see similar degrees of variability in the model, or do we need to pause it just from stochastics, or do we need to pause it other causes? So a given run of a model will yield, given realization of a model will yield particular outcomes for a particular set of inputs. But if we were to run for that same model, same inputs, run the model again and again, we'll typically see considerable variability across um, across uh, the model results. And by undertaking an intervention, we may see a, um, a big difference in terms of the outcomes. There's some uncertainty in both of these, but there are certain broad regularities that this intervention significantly reduced, uh, say, the burden of infection in lower SES um, uh, individuals um, and uh, and also uh, removed it almost entirely from high SES cases. Now, I did want to mention one aspect of, of, of history um, and one aspect of comparison here. I neglected to mention that just as in system dynamics, we have a cognate tradition of uh, compartmental modeling. In agent-based modeling, I view it as having a, a cognate tradition of micro-simulation. Um, practitioners out there will reasonably disagree um, as to whether these are fundamentally the same tradition or not. I view them as, as somewhat different, and certainly historically they've come from very different places. Uh, with agent-based modeling, so much of it originated in computer science um, mathematics that, that gave rise to computer science. Um, but in microsimulation, much of it came out of social sciences, economics, um, um, the work of, of, for example, the ORCUT, um, but also traffic engineering and, and modeling and, and policy use. Uh, like agent-based modeling, microsimulation is individuating. We individuate um, individuals and we perform them, um, uh, we perform the simulation in, in, as with agent-based models in a way that could be very crudely, but with great caution, called bottom-up. The fact is the world has no bottom and we have to be cognizant of that when we're setting model scope. But the point is we're, we're characterizing things at an individual level and seeing high level patterns that result. Um, micro simulation does differ from agent-based models in a number of different ways. Um, traditionally, it has focused on fairly independent agents, simulating say agents for pension planning over their entire life course without considering their interactions with others. With agent-based modeling, interactions are, are central to the model, whether uh, through networks or spatial interactions. Um, really what we're often interested with agent-based modeling is, is the emergent patterns that, that come out, um, not just the populations of agents in an atomistic way, but in a way that takes into account their coupling, their, their interactions. And that's a big distinction between the, um, uh, the approaches. So long, for, for many, many uh, years, and indeed the dominant mode for, many, for decades seemed to be that microsimulation would simulate individuals um, uh, in isolation, simulate them as solitudes, um, gain great understanding of an individual's life course progression without considering their interactions with the environment. And indeed, much of it um, was based on statistically grounded uh, tra transitions, which from an agent-based perspective are, 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 are kind of hard-coded in a way that doesn't take into account the use of models as, as learning tools. Many agent-based models are stylized. Um, they, they help us think through the interaction of of different factors at an individual level to, to see how, what patterns emerge from them. There's a lot of focus on phenomenological modeling and for testing the consistency of those patterns with what we do see from the, from the population. 
um, but not getting too caught up in the precise numbers coming out of it. By contrast, micro simulation has long focused on on um, uh, really capturing um, and incorporating uh, uh, empirically uh, empirical numbers. And compared to agent-based modeling, is focused more on observables and transitions between observable state, whereas agent-based modeling, like system dynamics, has traditionally been very comfortable with and made heavy use of latent states, states that are not directly observable, but that are uh, posited uh, to be involved. An example would be an exposed state. Maybe we don't have an easy way of measuring that in the population or an asymptomatic um, state, but but it seemed to be a key mechanistic point of understanding, a key element of the mechanistic processes. Microsimulation um, uh, has, has tended to deal in terms of observables and statistically grounded transitions in a way agent-based modeling traditions uh, haven't. Um, um, in both, you can find traditions of open and closed populations. Um, agent-based modeling has comparatively made more use of, of spatially explicit models embedded in, in, in geographic uh, space. Um, uh, but, but some of that uh, can also go on um, within the mechanisms of microsimulation. These days, the two traditions uh, cross-fertilize a great deal. And uh, personally, I've never gotten really caught up in in distinctions between fields. They're quite fluid historically. Microsimulation and agent-based models um, uh, have much more in common than they do um, in terms of uh, uh, you know, inherent uh, differences. They're more sociologic differences, differences in how they're used, the questions that are asked, what they assume fixed. From a formalism standpoint, they're quite uh, similar. Now, I'd like to contrast uh, the agent-based modeling on the one hand with system dynamics. In system dynamics modeling, to capture heterogeneity, we divide people up into stocks. Um, um, here it's stocks by, by status of their infection, but it could be stocks, say, susceptibles by age, susceptible zero to four, susceptible five to nine, susceptible 10 to 14, et cetera. Um, so we subdivide according to characteristics or state, um, uh, and each stock counts the number of people. The data items here are the, the number of people who are in that stock. Um, and we'll have, uh, uh, we'll have uh, say, if we have different cities, we'll find them in stocks in the same model. Um, within agent-based modeling, um, by contrast, we uh, are subdividing a model, not by characteristic or state, but rather we're subdividing it according to the actors, the individual um, uh, instances. Um, and each unit maintains its own state and attributes. Um, so uh, each unit, in system dynamics, we divided up the model, we organized it by state and characteristics, and the numbers the, the quantitative values were the count of people in each. Here we're organizing it by individual, and each individual keeps track of its own state and attributes. Um, if we have multiple contexts, say multiple cities, and we wanted to pick populations in multiple cities, we will often have a nested model. So we'll have two cities, but then within that city we'll have many individuals scattered. And, and the nesting of the agent-based model mirrors that of the world. In contrast to system dynamics, where we have a bunch of stocks representing, say, population in, or prevalence in this city, prevalence of that in that city, you know, susceptibles in city A, susceptibles in city B, and they're all at the same horizontal level, which doesn't nicely mirror the, the nesting um, in the population. So system dynamics, agent-based model, quite distinct. In my view, all these traditions, by virtue of being dynamic modeling, they share more commonalities um, than, um, uh, the, the commonalities are more important than the differences, I'll put it that way. They share so many commonalities um, that it's important to recognize them as, as at the least uh, cousins, if not uh, siblings. The final tradition, uh, the final tradition that I'll talk about here is one I'll spend comparatively less time on, um, 
but it's the discrete event modeling tradition. And in discrete event modeling, um, uh, like the other two traditions, goes back uh, many years. It doesn't really have a have a you know cognate that, that originated centuries ago. But like system dynamics, it originated in the 1950s, and and system dynamics came out uh, was inspired uh, much by the work of Forrester. By contrast, um, discrete event simulation was fo uh, was um, uh, followed on the work the seminal work of of Tocher. Um, with his general simulation program, which, interesting, like Forrester's focus at industrial application, but at a far, far lower level of granularity, finer level of granularity, I should say. A level um, not of, of broad patterns, as in system dynamics, but of, of, of individual processes and individual um, uh, events within those processes. Um, in the 1970s, uh, Conwell, uh, Johnson, and Maxwell put into place a, uh, a, a richer theory of discrete event simulation that, that helped um, map out its, uh, the, the, the fundamental conceptual uh, structure of it. Um, much of uh, Tocher's work was focused at a very applied work in, in industrial uh, scheduling and, and, um, and job planning context, etc. Between those times, in the 1960s, there was a uh, proliferation of, 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 uh, of work at an applied level for, for characterizing um, uh, simulations. Uh, there are the first examples of health applications focusing more on uh, health services delivery, as I, if, I, if I'm correct. Um, I'd have to double check that. Um, that's the typical application of this work. And interestingly, there was uh, our early work on, on um, multiple uh, level uh, languages and languages that are a higher level of abstraction to specify these models, recognizing that they needed to be specified, they, they were fruitfully specified at a, and at a different level than there was just general purpose um, um, programming. Beyond the theoretical uh, foundations laid by uh, Conway, Johnson, and Maxwell in the 70s, there was also in the 70s, um, the 70s witnessed a strong expansion and lots of additional healthcare applications. Uh, by, the, by the late 70s, 1978, already a review had listed 92 applications of discrete event simulation within the, um, within the health sphere. and. Um, Indeed, it remains a um, central contributor to system science when applied to, um, when applied to health. Work here focuses on systems which are, which are subject to more structured depiction. Their work, typically their workflow structure. We have some workflow. We have a series of, of structured tasks that are not necessarily linear. There can be branches, there can be, uh, can be loops. But it's a series of tasks that are undertaken one after the other in a way that's almost invariably resource constrained. There's uh, capacity to resource pools, resource pools that they're only of a certain size, and we can only proceed uh, through a task, say undergoing a CAT scan, if, um, if the uh, the CT scan is is, is available. Um, we can uh, only be um, placed into a bed if a bed is available in the in the ED. So it's resource constrained modeling in these constrained workflows. And uh, there's a particular interest in and, and uh, suitable um, uh, prominence of representation of, of queuing. Um, if a resource is not available and one's waiting, one awaits that resource by being placed in a queue, much as you might be placed outside in an x-ray area for waiting for the, the, patient, the current patient to get out to be wheeled in. Um, there's processes operating on the entities that are flowing through the system. Um, these flow charts uh, depict the system in a structured way. It tends not to be very good fit for systems that are less well structured, but it's an exquisite fit, exceptionally powerful for systems that are. Um, and it's notable that this field, uh, mi like micro simulation, has tended to draw, on, draw very heavily on the um, uh, on the uh, tradition of, of statistical grounding of models. Um, so grounding for, say, the waiting times for certain processes. And indeed, 
practitioners will sometimes recognize an underlying connection with the statistical simulation literature where we're using simulation not in a dynamic sense, but in a sense of drawing successive values from realizations of a stochastic process. Discrete event simulation provides a remarkably crisp, expressive, powerful, and targeted way to represent processes of structured workflows given limited resources. We're often interested here in the throughput and the latency, the length of waiting times, the, the length uh, of, of, of the waiting queue. We're interested in health very typically and identifying the impact on health service delivery, throughput of waiting time of the level of resourcing, resource coordination or placement of resource within a facility. This sort of, of, of modeling is, is often placed in a facility that uh, admits to a, to a very detailed representation of room layout and placement of resources may have a, have a big impact on, on movement times, etc. Um, so we're interested in a lower, much lower level of abstraction than traditionally has been featured in system dynamics um, and um, much more interested in sort of resource constraints and limits and structured workflows um, than in uh, agent-based modeling. A, a, a particular difference from agent-based modeling, while well, both traditions um, uh, admit to a individual level representation, here the entities flow through the system, the entities are typically here pass fairly passive. They flow through. They do interact with each other, but it's typically limited to keeping each other waiting for a resource. They're not typically interacting to spread perception about whether to stick by or to balk and, and leave without being seen. They're not uh, spreading pathogen. Um, uh, they're not engaged in, in um, mutual self-care while, while waiting or what have you. So this sort of modeling entities are predominantly passive the action and the attention is on the processes and the service delivery. Um, and the agents, while they might be heterogeneous, are, are typically uh, uh, fairly passive and not really uh, active. Important exceptions, for example, within our work and hybrid models of this with agent-based modeling, which are rich potential. Um, there's lower abstraction challenges. Typically, managers, um, uh, stakeholders within the system can often be uh, uh, very um, uh, very involved and helpful in mapping out a system's processes. Um, it, it maps more or less directly to their experience. And so there's lower abstraction than, to, for example, to characterize stocks of agents in different states. This sort of modeling is readily accessible to stakeholders. And to its great credit, it's often articulated um, much more so than traditionally has been the case in agent-based modeling, in a way, a visual way that, that's amenable to showing to stakeholders, to elicit their understanding. Very importantly, that can also, of course, open the door to eliciting their critiques, both the model structure and if the outcomes from the model. It has comparatively low reliance compared to agent-based modeling on computational skills. Models are articulated um, in a uh, in simplified ways that uh, that don't require as much uh, programming uh, savviness or or software engineering all too often required say for for models in in platforms like uh, repast or swarm um uh, and even things like net logo to build your own model um here by contrast uh, models have are, are often specified very visually and are amenable to to stakeholder understanding as well as to higher level um, appreciation, um, abstract description. And there's a, there's a high emphasis here, as I noted, on evidence-based uh, um, distributions to parameterize the model. Um, so here's an example of a, of a workflow that might be uh, used to characterize things. Now, in my final comments here, I'll just note there's a welter of detail here about these different traditions we've seen. Um, uh, but, you know, I think it's, I, I want to emphasize that all of these methodologies, they're not competing for the same prize. In fact, 
they each bring unique features to the situation. They're highly complementary. And I say this advisedly as someone who's made quite high use of all of the traditions, extensive use of system dynamics and agent-based modeling. You should go to advice here to people who have spent, you know, built dozens of models in each of the traditions to get a grounded line of, of advice about these things. I would advise you very strongly about taking uh, strong advice about which tradition to use uh, purely from someone who's who's focused on on one tradition. You want someone who's uh, of open mind, but uh, of equal or greater importance, tremendous experience in applying the different traditions. These different modeling methodologies, for ways that won't be obvious for someone who's not really familiar with them, um, are quite um, uh, quite complementary because, in part, they seek to answer different types of traditions. It's very in it's very easy for the casual observer, and indeed for uh, partisan uh, observers, uh, partial to one tradition or another, and boy is this a tribalist area, to get caught up in specific features. The visual representation, particular features of the software, um, to, to, you know, um, uh, to strut about certain aspects of the formalisms or, or value. But the deeper distinctions, while these are important considerations, well, I, I argued representation of stochastics is important. The value of representing heterogeneity, as we do also in age based modeling, very important for many health issues. The ability to capture individual trajectories over time. Uh, which is possible in individual level formulations, but not in an aggregate system dynamics model. Very important. But the deeper issue here is model purposes differ. Um, the, the model types typically answer different types of questions. The types of questions being investigated are different. The natures of the problems being addressed are different. And as a result, the problem framing is different. The focus of analysis is different. System dynamics has traditionally tended to focus on higher level dynamic patterns. It's focused more fundamentally yet traditionally on changing people's mental models, adjusting thinking about the system, broadening narrow understanding. And as such, it's tended to focus on simpler models, models whose depiction is readily accessible at a high level. Um, uh, the questions being brought to the table in agent-based models or certainly micro simulation models are, are typically very different and, and similarly with discrete event model modeling. Despite what you may hear, no one system of science methodology offers a replacement for the others. Um, uh, my experience uh, in this area over decades and uh, frankly as a computer scientist also specializing in, in language issues for much of my career is it clearly points out, it's, it's, it's very clear, no one is a replacement for the others and one will do oneself harm if you use um, one thinking that you're going to be able to use it for all the problems that are addressed by others, you can use your cherished uh, tradition. Um, frankly, um, you're, you're fooling yourself if, if, it, if, if, if someone goes down that route. Um, uh, in fact, each of these traditions is complementary and there's significant synergies within a given project to use combinations methodology. My, my own suggestion is to use um, hybrid modeling where possible because it allows us to, to as we learn from modeling, which is a key uh, focus of, of interest uh, for many modeling projects, we want to learn from the modeling. That informs where we need to deepen the model, how we need to deepen the model. And using a hybrid modeling approach allows us to do that in a rich way that um, uh, that, it, that gives dignity to that learning and lets us shape the model in a direction um, that is true to that learning. Um, uh, we also, um, uh, uh, I will strongly advise using multiple models uh, within the same project, even if you don't use hybrid models as cross checks on each other to deepen thinking, to, get, to provide different perspectives. For example, a high level system dynamics model at first, as Jeff McDonald talks about to, to sort of map out um, 
uh, where one might explore, where one might put those systems explore, where one might uh, intervene, but an agent-based model to really how to intervene and to represent it in a way that's that that captures uh, individual stories and that captures effects of targeted interventions and that tar and perhaps weaves in some discrete event modeling for service going, etc. So a key couple a couple key take home messages here. Models express dynamic hypotheses about processes that underlie observed behavior in the world. And these models help us understand how diverse factors relevant to health disparities combine to yield observed patterns. Um, uh, how, how diverse tangled factors um, yield patterns we see and, and how intervention might affect uh, these, these uh, health burdens. Models are specific to purpose we build different models for different purposes, and indeed we use different modeling approaches for different purposes. Multiple modeling types offer complementary advantages for describing processes that underlie health outcomes. And some of the greatest promise in this sphere comes, ladies and gentlemen, from hybrid approaches. Thank you again for your attention during this longer talk. I hope this uh, talk uh, offers some help in uh, providing some guidance as to the use of agent-based uh, system dynamics and discrete event modeling, but more broadly orients you with respect to um, system science traditions and health. You can find many of my other videos that go into much more detail on different subcomponents of this, um, but I uh, hope this talk has uh, conferred value by bringing several features together. Thank you very much.